Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Gorilla Theater's 17th annual summer Greek show. Greek show? Greek <laughs> show. Um, in case you don't know, we are systematically working our way through all 33 existing Greek shows. This is our halfway point. Gorilla Theater, it, its mission is to educate train and culturally enrich the community. Uh, we are about ready to, this fall, we will celebrate our 18th birthday. And we do more than just the Greek shows. Uh, we have performed over 100 productions in over 30 different venues throughout the Kansas City area in the last 18 years. So please check out our website at guerrillatheater.org or keep in touch with KC Stage to find out information on our happenings with uh, Gorilla Theater other than just the Greek show, but thank you again for coming out to today's production. I'd like to thank some of our uh, benefactors and people behind the scenes that have helped out this year. I'd like to thank our patrons for without you we couldn't have this production. Uh, thank you for keep coming back year year and, and every morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Leo Weatherill for without his support uh, None of this could have happened this year. I'd also like to thank uh, our set designers, Steve Elliott, uh, also uh, our uh, security watch at night is here 24-7 uh, while we're here at the park this weekend. So thank you much to him. Uh, I'd also like to thank UMKC and Potluck Productions for their support on this production. And uh, I'd also like to mention, as with uh, Barbara, our director, thanks to her and her hard work and effort on this production. But she has mentioned that her theme of this production is to concentrate on women in slavery. And I just found out yet the other day there is a program coming on this evening, actually on the Oxygen Channel, about slavery um, in India, women's slavery in India. And uh, there are more slaves, mostly women and children, slavery today than there has been ever in the history of the world. So think about that as you sit back, relax, and watch Hecula. of the dead, from the somber door that opens into hell, where no god goes I have come, the ghost of Polydorus, son, and was the last surviving male heir of Hecuba, and Priam, king of Troy. My father, fearing that Troy would fall to the assembled arms of Hellas, had me conveyed in secret out of danger sending me here, to Thrace, to Polymester, who rules this fertile plain of Chersonese and curbs with harsh power a nation of horsemen. With me, my father sent a great sum of gold, intending that if Troy should someday fall, his living sons would be provided for. Being the youngest, I was chosen, still too small and slight to carry arms and throw a spear. But as long as Troy's great ramparts stood proud and unbreached, 
as long as our towers held intact. And Hector, my other brother, prospered in the fighting. I flourished under the care of my father's best friend, a green shoot thriving under his watchful eye. But when Troy fell, and Hector died, and picks and shovels rooted up our earth, and there, by the altar that Apollo's hands once built, I am fell, butchered by Achilles' son. And then my father's so-called friend took off his mask <coughs> and moved by nothing more than simple greed, murdered me and threw my body out to sea. Here, pounded by the surf, my corpse still lies carried up and down on the heaving swell of the sea. Unburied and unmourned. Disembodied now, I hover as a wraith over my mother's head, riding for three long days upon the air. Three suffering days of slavery and bitterness since she came to Troy and left Chersonese. Here, on the shore of Thrace, in sudden idleness, beside its ships the whole Achaean army waits and cannot sail. <coughs> For Achilles' ghost appeared, stalking on his tomb, wailing, and stuck the ships on their way out to sea on their journey home demanded my sister, Polyxena, as prize. The blood of the living to sweeten the dead man's grave. And he shall have her, a prize of honor and a gift bestowed upon him by his friends. On this day, destiny shall take my sister down to her grave. Mother, on this day you must see your two last children dead. My sister slaughtered, and my unburied body washed upon shore at the feet of a slave. These were the favors that I asked of the gods below to find my mother and be buried by her hands. And they have granted me my request. Now I go, for there I see my mother coming from Agamemnon's tent, still shaken from that dream in which she saw my ghost. Oh, mother. Oh, majesty. Oh, fallen queen shorn of greatness, pride, and everything but life. Which leaves you now, slavery, bitterness, and lonely age. Some god destroys you now, exacting in your suffering the cost for once having been happy in this life. Oh, helplessness of age, too old, too weak to stand. Help me, women of Troy. Give this slave your hands you offered to her once when she was queen of Troy. Help these useless, stumbling legs to walk. O oh, light of heaven, star of Zeus, shining in the night. What apparitions rose? What shape of terror stopped the darkness? O oh, goddess Earth, womb of dreams whose dusky wings like bats trouble the flickering air. Beat back that dream I dreamed, that dream of horror that rose in the night. Those phantoms of children, Polydorus.
promised my son in Thrace, Pelexina, my daughter, call back those visions of horror. O oh, gods who protect this land, preserve my son, the last surviving anchor of the house of Troy, still warded in the snows of Thrace, still protected by his father's friend. Terror I dreamed. Disaster on disaster, never has my heart so shivered with fear. Oh, Helenus, interpreter of dreams, I need you now. Cassandra, my daughter, help me interpret my dreams. I saw a little dove, a dappled dove, torn from between my knees, cruelly ripped away, mangled by some wolf with blood-red nails. And then another terror rose. I saw Achilles stalking his tomb, howling, screaming, demanding a prize from the women of Troy. Oh, God, to protect this land, beat back this dream, preserve my children. We come to you in haste, Hecuba. We left the tents where the lot assigned us. Slaves now, torn from our homes, where Troy was sacked and burnt by the conquering We bring you painful news. We cannot lighten your load. To bear. Just now, in full assembly, the Greek decree came down. They voted your daughter must die. Oh, to be slaughtered alive on the tomb of Achilles. The sails had been unfurled, the fleet stood out to sea, when from his tomb Achilles rose, armor blazing, and shouted, Ho, Argives! Where do you sail, leaving my grave unhonored? Waves of argument broke loose, dividing Greek from Greek. If one man argued for death, another fought against it. On your behalf spoke Agamemnon, mother of your daughter, poor man Cassandra. Then the two sons of Theseus rose and spoke, but both with one intent, to crown Achilles' grave with living blood, asking if Cassandra's love meant more than the courage of Achilles. And so the struggle swayed, equally poised, until he spoke, that hypocrite with honey tongue, that demagogue Odysseus, and in the end he won, asking what one slave is worth when laid in the balance with the honor of Achilles. He wouldn't have the dead descending down to Hades, telling tales of Greek ingratitude to Greeks who fell for Hellas on the foreign field of Troy. And he is coming here to take your daughter from your breast and wrench her from your arms. Go to the temple. Go to the shrine. Fall at Agamemnon's knees. Fall on heaven's gods. Invoke the gods below. Unless your prayers prevent her death, unless your pleas can keep her safe, you shall see your child lying face down here on the earth, and the black stains spread on the earth as the red blood drops from the gleaming gold chain that lies broken at her throat. Fall, oh, grief. What can I say? What are the words for loss? Oh, bitterness of age, slavery not to be born, unendurable pain. But to whom can I turn? Child is homeless. My husband murdered my city stained with fire. To whom can I turn? What God above or power below can help me now? Oh, women of Troy, heralds of evil, bringers of doom, this news you bring is my sentence of death. But why should I live? How live in the light when all goodness is gone, when all I have left is grief? Bear me up, poor stumbling feet. Take me to the tent. Something in your 
your face frightens me. Oh, my child, my child. You must tell me, mother. A dreadful rumor has come. Some Greek decree that touches your life. Touches my life. How? For God's sake, mother, speak. The Greeks in full assembly have decreed your death. A living sacrifice upon Achilles' tomb. Anything I could. 
anything to live. And I let you have your life. I set you free. Because of what you did, I live today. Then how can you say your treatment of me now is not contemptible? To take what you admit you took and do everything you can do to be wrong and ruin me. Oh, God, protect me from this thankless breed, these politicians who care, who cringe for favor from the screaming mob, care not what harm they do their friends, so long as they can please the crowd. Tell me, Odysseus, on what feeble grounds can you justify this vote of death? Political necessity? But how? And what politics condone the shedding of human blood on a grave where custom calls for cattle? Or is it merely vengeance that Achilles' ghost requires, some death for his death and exacts of her? What has she to do with his revenge? Who has caused him less harm than this poor girl? If it's revenge he wants, let Helen die. He went to Troy for her, for her he died. Or is it merely looks that you require? Some surpassing beauty in a girl whose dying loveliness might appease the hurt of this fastidious ghost. Then look not to loveliness from us. Look to Helen, loveliest of the lovely women by far. Lovely Helen, who has done him far more harm than we. So much by way of answer to the justice of your case. Now, Odysseus, let me present my claim for your consideration, my just demand for payment of your debt of life. You admit you came, fell at my feet, grabbed my hand, and begged for mercy. But see, I touch you back as you touched me. I kneel at your feet and beg for mercy back. Let her stay with me. Let her live. Surely there are enough dead without her death. And in her is everything I lost. This one life redeems them all. She is my comfort, my Troy, my nurse, my staff. She guides me on my way. She is all I have. You have power, Odysseus, greatness and power, but use them gently, touch them kindly, for power gives, power gives no power to the hand, soon perishes and greatness goes. I know, I too once was great, but am nothing now. One day cut down my greatness and my pride, but I implore you, Odysseus, take on us. Go to the Greeks, argue with them, coax them, convince them that what they do is wrong. Accuse them of murder. <clears throat> Tell them we are helpless. We are women, the same women they tore from sanctuary at their altars, but they pitied us then, they spared us then. Plead with them. Read to them your laws of murder. Tell them how it a place to slave or free without distinction, but go. Even if your arguments were made, if you faltered or forgot your words, it would not matter. For in themselves that, that power, that prestige you have would guarantee success, swelling in your words and borrowing from what you are a resonance and force denied to less important men. Believe me, was 
sincerely and kindly meant. I readily admit, moreover, the extent of my debt. Everything I am today, I owe to you. And in return, I stand ready and willing to honor my debt by saving your life. Indeed, I have never suggested otherwise. But note, I said your life, not your daughter's life. It's a very different matter altogether. The day we captured Troy, I gave my word your daughter should be given to our best soldier as a prize upon my upon request. That was my promise, a public solemn commitment which I intend to keep. Besides, there is a principle at stake and one, moreover, in whose neglect or breach governments have fallen and cities have come to grief because their bravest, their most exceptional men have received no greater honor than the common run. And Achilles deserves our honor far more than most. The great man, the great soldier, who died greatly for his country. Tell me, what conduct could be worse than to give your friend a lifetime of honor and respect, but neglect him when he dies? And what then, if war should come again and we enlist our citizens to serve, would we fight or would we look to our lives seeing that dead men get no honor? Now, for my lifetime, give me nothing more than what I need. I ask no more. In my death, I hope for honor, since honor in the grave has eternity to run. You speak of pity, but I can talk of pity too. Pity us, pity our old people, those old men and women far no less miserable than yours, those wives and mothers whose brave young sons found their grave in the dust of Troy. Endure, bear your losses, and if you think me wrong to find courage in a man, then call me callous. But what of you, you foreigners, who refuse your dead their rights and break your faith with friends, and you wonder then that Hellas should prosper while uh, your country suffer the fate they deserve. This is what it means to be a slave. To be abused and endure. Oh, my child. All oh, my prayers are lost, thrown away on the empty air. Use your powers now. Implore him. Use every skill that pity has, every voice. Touch him, move him, fall at his feet and beg for life. Even he has children too. May pity them. I see your hand, Odysseus, hidden in the folds of your robes, and your face averted, lest I try to touch your hand or beard and beg for life. You are safe from me. I will not call on Zeus who helps the helpless. I will not beg for a life. No, I go with you because I must. But most because I wish to die. If I refuse, I prove myself a coward in love with life. But why should I live? I had a father once, king of Phrygia, and so I started life a princess of the blood, nourished on lovely hopes to be a bride for kings. And suitors came, competing for the honor of my hand, as I stood over the girls and women of Troy, acknowledged to be mistress, courted and envied by all, all but a goddess, though bound by death. And now I am a slave. It is 
that name, slave. So ugly, so strange that makes me want to die. Or should I live? To be knocked down to a bidder, sold to a master for cash? Sister of Hector, sister of princes, doing the work of a drudge, compelled to drag out endless weary days. And the bride of kings, forced by some low slave to share his filthy bed. Never. With eyes still free, I renounce the light and dedicate myself to I see nothing in this life to give me hope, and nothing at all is living for me. As for you, mother, do nothing. Say nothing to hinder me now. Help me instead. Help me to die before I live disgraced. I am a novice to this life of shame, this yoke I might be.
farewell. Let others farewell. I never shall. Goodbye, Polydorus, my brother in grace. If he lives at all, for all I have is lost. He lives. He shall close your dying eyes. I died of suffering while I was still alive. Even before I die, my cries have broken my mother's heart. She has broken mine. And life is precious now. 
But I would rather die than sink as low as this poor woman has fallen now. Rise, lady. Lift your head to the light. Raise that body blanched with age. Who are you who will not let me lie? Who disturbs my wretchedness? Why? I am Talthybius, lady. Herald of the Greeks. I bring you a message from Agamemnon. Have the Greeks decreed my death? If that is your news, you are welcome, Herald, for no other news would please me now. No. Not that. I come on behalf of the army and the sons of Atreus to bid you bury your daughter. She is dead. That is your news. I cannot die. You have come to tell me this? Oh, my child, my poor child, torn from my arms, dead. Dead and all my children died with you. How did you put her to death? With honor and respect? Or did you kill her savagely with cold brutality? Tell me, let me hear it all, everything, no matter how it hurts. There is a cost in telling, too. A double price of tears. For I was crying when your daughter died. And I will cry again while telling you, old lady. But, listen. The whole army of the Greeks drawn up in ranks, was present at the execution, waiting and watching, while Polyxena was led by Achilles' son slowly through the center of the camp and up the tomb. I stood nearby, while behind her came a troop of soldiers, purposely appointed to prevent her struggles. Then Achilles' son lifted a golden beaker to pour the offering of wine to his father's ghost and nodded to me to call for silence. Quiet, Achaeans! I shouted. Silence in the ranks! And instantly a hush <laughs> fell upon the army and he began to pray. Great ghost of my father Achilles, <coughs> receive this offering I pour to charm your spirit up. Rise and drink this gift we give to you, this virgin's fresh blood. Be gracious to us. Set free our ships and loose our anchor ropes. Grant to us all our day of coming home. Grant us all to come home safe from Troy. So he prayed, and the army with him. Then, grasping his sword by its golden hilt, he slipped it from the sheath and made a sign to the soldiers to seize her. But she spoke first. Wait, you Greeks who sacked my city. Of my own free will I die. Let no man touch me. I offer my throat willingly to the sword. I will not flinch, but let me be free for now. Let me die free. I am of royal blood, and I scorn to die the death of a slave. Free her! The army roared, and Agamemnon ordered his men to let her go. The instant they released their hold, she grasped her robes at the shoulder and ripped them open down the sides as far as the waist, exposing her naked breasts, bare and lovely, like a sculpted goddess. Then she sank, kneeling on the ground, and spoke her most heroic words. Strike, Captain, here is my breast. Will you stab me there or in the neck? Here is my throat, bared for your blow. Torn 
between pity and duty, Achilles' son stood hesitating and then slashed her throat with the edge of his sword. The blood gushed out as she fell dying to the ground. But even as she dropped, managed to fall with grace, modestly hiding what should be hidden from men's eyes. The execution finished. The soldiers set to work. Some scattered leaves upon a corpse, while others brought branches of pine to heap a pyre. Those who shirked <laughs> found themselves abused by the rest. You loafers, they shouted. How can you stand there empty-handed, doing nothing? Where is your prison for the girl? When did you ever see greater courage than that? Now you know it all. For my part, having seen your daughter die, I count you of all women the one most blessed in her children, and also the unhappiest. No, no, child. no disaster falls from the heavens, shaking in the suffering my house and the city of Priam. Oh, my child, my child, how do I deal with this thronging crowd of blows, these terrors? each with its own petition demanding attention. If I turn to cope with one, another shoulders in, and then a third comes on, distracting each fresh wave, breeding a new successor as it breaks. What with this last blow? I cannot cope at all. Cannot stop seeing your death. Cannot stop crying.
slavery was ordained, the ruin of my life made inevitable on the day when Paris, Prince of Troy, had timber felled from the pine woods of Mount Ida to build a ship for his voyage to Greece to win the bed of Helen, the loveliest woman who ever lived in the light of the golden sun. Grief, and worse than grief, necessity surrounds us. One man's mad folly made a universal curse on all who lived by Troy's river. Ruin burst forth. Seaborne disaster swept in when Paris sat in judgment on three goddesses. His verdict was war. The outcome, spears and murder and my home dishonored. And lamentations also arise on the banks of a sunny Greek river where a Spartan girl lies crying alone in her room. A mother mourning dead children lifts hands to head and tears out gray hairs and rakes down her cheeks with nails god bloody from her sacrifice. Where is the queen, women? Where is Hecuba, whose suffering outstrips all other runners? This crown no one shall take away. Speak, woman, what new sorrow do you bring her? This is the grief I bring to Hecuba. Gentle words are hard to find. The burden I bring is disaster. Where is the queen? Father. 
foolish friend. Our loyal friend in Thrace, where his father sent him out of harm to be safe. Our loyal friend in Thrace. Murdered? Murdered by a friend? For gold unspeakable, unimaginable crime, unbearable. But where is friendship now? Monster! So pitiless! To mangle him so! To hack his sweet flesh with a knife! <laughs> Hecuba, no one suffers more than this poor queen! Oh. <laughs> Your suffering has no end. 
I died while I was still living. Nothing can touch me now. What woman on this earth was ever cursed like this? There was only goddess suffering herself. But let me tell you why I kneel. And if you think my suffering just, I must be content. But if otherwise, let me have my revenge on this treacherous friend who flouted every god in heaven and in hell to do this brutal murder. And on table, he was a frequent guest, held me first among our friends, respected, honored by me, given every kindness a man could meet. And then, in cold deliberation, he murdered my son. Murder may have its reasons, its motives, but this, to refuse my son a grave, to toss him into the sea, unburied? I am a slave, I know, and slaves are weak, but the gods are strong, and above the gods there stands some absolute, some moral law or order of principle more final, final still. Upon this law, our world depends. Through it, the gods exist. By it, we live, defining good from evil. Apply that law to me. For if you flout it now, and those who commit cold-blooded murder and defy the gods go unpunished, then human justice withers, corrupted at its source. Honor my request, Agamemnon. Punish this murder. Pity me. Be as a painter. Stand back. See me in perspective. See me whole. See my wretchedness. Oh, God, you turn away. What can I say? All hope is lost. This helplessness. Why? Why do we make so much of knowledge? Struggle so hard for some skill not worth the effort. But persuasion, the only art whose power is absolute, worth any price we pay, we totally neglect. And so we fail and lose all our hope. now to urge the claims of love, but let me urge them anyway. At your side sleeps my daughter Cassandra, once priestess of Apollo. What will you give my lord for those nights of love? What thanks for all her tenderness in bed does she receive from you? And I am turned Cassandra's brother. Avenge him. Be kind to her by being kind to him. And one word more. If by magic some gift of the gods I could become all speech, tongues in my arms, hands that talked, voices speaking, crying from my hair and from my feet, then I would at your feet, begging, crying, imploring with a thousand tongues. Oh, Master, greatest light of Hellas, hear me. Help an old woman avenge her. She is nothing, nothing at all. But hear her anyway. Do your duty as a man of honor. See justice done. Condemn this murder. I pity you deeply, Hecuba, for the tragic death of this poor boy, and I am touched and stirred by your request. So far as justice is concerned, the gods know nothing would please me more than to bring this murderer to book. But my position here is delicate. If I give you your revenge, the army is sure to charge that I connived at the death of the King of Thrace because of my love for Cassandra. This is my dilemma. The army sees Polymester as its friend, 
this boy as its enemy. You love your son, but what do your affections matter to the Greeks? Put yourself in my position. Believe me, Hecuba, I should like to act on your behalf and would come instantly to your defense. But if the army mutters, I must be slow.
the songs and sacrifice, the dances, all were done. My husband lay asleep, his spear upon the wall, forgetting for a moment the ships drawn up on Ilium's shore. As I was setting my hair in the soft folds of the net, gazing at the endless lights deep in the golden mirror, preparing myself for bed, when tumult broke the air and shouts and cries shattered the empty streets. Onward, onward, you Greeks! Saft the city of Troy and see your homes once more. Dressed only in a gown like a girl of Sparta, I left the bed of love and prayed to Artemis. But no answer came. I saw my husband lying dead, and they took me overseas. As I looked back at my city, the ship homeward bound moved its keel and severed me forever from Troy's earth. I fainted then. A woman brought low. And I call down a curse upon Helen, sister of the heavenly twins, and upon the herdsmen of Ida, Paris, the plague of Troy, for it was their marriage. No marriage, but a fiend of fate that brought me from my home in Troy into a life of slavery. I pray that Helen never reaches her father's home, but is drowned in the salt sea. <laughs> Quite enough to last my life. 
You know why I asked for you and your sons? Not yet. We are waiting to hear. You are my friend. A friend in whom I feel no less love than you have shown to me. <laughs> and my business concerns. Yes, yes, go on. The ancient vaults, the gold of Brian's house. I am to impart this information to your son. In person, for I know you to be a man of honor. But why did you ask that my sons be present? Oh, I felt they should know. Something, for instance, might happen to you. A prudent precaution. I quite agree. Do you remember where Athena's temple once stood in Troy? The gold is there. Is there a marker? A black rock jutting up above the ground. Is there anything else? Yes. My jewels. I smuggled some jewels from Troy. Could you? Keep them for me. Um, uh, you have them with you? <laughs> Where are they hidden? Oh, they are inside the tent, under a heap of spoils. Inside the tent? Here? In the Greek camp? The women's quarters are separate from the main camp. Is it safe? Are there men around? No men. Only women. <laughs> but we must go inside. There is no time to lose. raise their anchors and sail for Troy. Then, when our business here is done, you may go and take your children where you left my son. Oh, it's that blue. 
blood to rip the living flesh, feed like a starving beast, blood for blood. Oh, God. But where? Where? No, no, no. Where am I running now? Where? Oh, my children, abandoned, left for furies to claw, for savage bist bitches to gorge, their mangled bodies thrown to whiten on the hill. But where? Where can I run? Where can I go? Where can I stand at bay? Oh, I'll run for my lair. Like a ship, sails furled for the shore. Uh, I'll run for my lair and stand at bay. Uh, where my children are. Oh, 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 Help! Where are you? Where? Help! Help! Oh, gods! To... Let me fly to heaven, please. You gods in heaven, give me weeks to fly. Let me leap to heaven, where the vaulted stars, Sirius and Orion, Flare forth their fires, or plunge to Hades on the blackened flood. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, 
further. When the Greeks, I feared when the Greeks heard that Priam's son was still alive, that they would raise a second expedition against this new Troy. In which case, this fur, these fertile plains of Thrace would once again be ravaged by war. Once again, Troy and her troubles would work her neighbor's harm. Those same hardships, my lord, which we in Thrace have suffered in this war. Hercuba, however, somehow hearing hearing that her son was dead or murdered, lured me here on the pretext of revealing the secret hiding place of Priam's gold in Troy. Then, uh, alleging that we might be overheard, she led my sons and me into the tent unattended surrounded by Trojan women on every side, I took my seat upon a couch. <coughs> the atmosphere seemed one of friendliness. The women uh, fingered my robes uh, and lift, they lifted the fabric into the light to inspect it, uh, uh, exclaiming shrilly over the quality of our Thracian weaving. Uh, still others stood there admiring my plants, and before I knew it, I was stripped of spear and shield alike. Meanwhile, uh, the young mothers were fussing over my children, uh, jouncing them in their arms with hugs and kisses and passing them from arm to arm <laughs> until they were quite out of reach. Then, incredibly, out of that sea of domestic peace, they suddenly pulled daggers from their robes and butchered both my sons, while, while troops of women rushed to tackle me, seizing me in my arms and legs and holding me down. I, I, tried, I tried to leap up, but they caught me by the hair and pulled me down. I fought to free my arms, but they swapped me, and I, I went down beneath a flood of women, unable to move a muscle. And then, oh gods, they crown their hideous work with worse outrage, the most inhuman, brutal crime of all. They lifted their brooches and stabbed these bleeding eyes again and again. Then they ran for cover, scattering through the tent, I, I leaped to my feet, groping along the wall, groping along the wall, stalking them down like a, a, a wounded animal hunting a pack of hounds, battering at the wall, battering at the wall. <laughs> this is my reward. Agamemnon, for my efforts in disposing of your enemies. But I suffer now. I suffer for you. One word more. On behalf of all those dead, Learned their hatred of women long ago. For those who hate them now, for those unborn who shall live to hate them yet, I now declare my firm conviction neither earth nor ocean produces a creature as savage and monstrous as. Woman! This... This is my experience. I 
know that this is true. of a man, Agamemnon, should speak louder than any words. Good words should get their goodness by our lives, nowhere else. The evil we do should show, a rottenness that festers in what we say and how we speak, incapable of being glorified by a film of pretty words. There are men I know, sophists, who make a science of persuasion causing evil with the slick of loveliness. But soon a specious, a speciousness will show. The imposter is punished. No one escapes his death. So much by way of beginning. And now for him. He claims he killed my son on your behalf, Agamemnon to spare you Greeks the horrors of a second war. You liar! First, what possible friendship could exist between civilized Greeks and half savages such as you? Clearly none. Then why this zeal to serve their cause? Are you related to them or bound to them by marriage? What was your motive then? Fear say that they might sail for Troy, burn your crops, and ravage your kingdom in passing. Who could believe such a preposterous lie? No. If you want the truth, I will tell you why. It was your greed for gold that killed my son. Sheer greed. Nothing more. What explains your conduct then and now? Why, when Troy still flourished, if you loved the Greeks as much as you say, when Priam had his life and Hector had his day, did you not murder my son? Or take him prisoner, at least, while he was at your mercy? But, no. You waited <coughs> until our sun had set and the smoke announced the sack of Troy. Then you moved, killing your guest who sat helpless at your hearth. <laughs> and what of this, which shows your crime for what it was? If you loved the Greeks as much as you assert, why did you fail to present them with the gold? The same gold, you say, does not belong to you, but Agamemnon. But they were desperate then, years away from home. Oh, no. Even now, you cannot bear the thought of giving up that gold, but hoard it for yourself at home. If you had done your duty by my son, raised him, kept him safe, men would think you were honorable and noble, an honorable friend, for true friendship shows in times of trouble. Prosperity is full of friends. And then someday, if you had stood in need, my son would have been your friend and treasury. But killing him, you killed your loyal friend. Your gold is worthless now. Your sons are dead, and you are who you are. Agamemnon, if you were quit this man, you prove yourself unjust. This is a man who has betrayed his trust, murdered against the laws of God and man, faithless, evil, corrupt. Acquit him now, and we shall say the same is true of you. My 
say no more. Well spoken, Hecuba. The just always have arguments that are true. It gives me no pleasure to sit as judge on the misery of others. But I should cut a sorry figure in the world if I allowed this case to come to court and then refused or failed to give a verdict. Now then, Polly Mester, I find you guilty of murder as charged. <laughs> you murdered your ward, killed him in cold blood, and not, as you assert, for me or the Greeks, but out of simple greed to get his gold. You then construed the facts to fit your case. Perhaps you think it is a trifling matter to kill a guest. We Greeks call it murder. <laughs> you committed a brutal crime. How, therefore, could I acquit you now without losing face among men? I could not do it. Accept the consequences of your fate. Oh, gods! Contempt! Defeated by a woman! By a slave! Condemned for what you did! Justly condemned! Oh, my children! Oh, light! Light of my eyes! Hurts, does it? And what of me? I mourn for my children, too. Does it give you pleasure to mock at me? I rejoice in my revenge. <laughs> Enjoy it now. You shall not enjoy it long. Hear my prediction. I foretell that you shall be carried across the sea in ships to Hella. Shall drown at sea. You shall climb the masthead and fall. Pushed by force. You shall climb the mast of your own free will. Climb the mast with wings. Changed to a dog, a bitch with blazing eyes. And how could you know of this transformation? Oh, because our prophet from Thrace, Dionysus, told me so. I see he neglected to tell you your own fate. Had he told my future then, I never would have stumbled in your trap. Shall I live or die? Die! And when you die, your tomb shall be called... In honor of my chain. Sinosima, the bitch's grave. <laughs> to sailors. I care not how I die. I have my revenge. <laughs> Your daughter, Cassandra, must also die. Sir, spit your prophecies back. Use them on yourself. Killed by this man's wife. Cut down by the bitter keeper of his house. Oh, Clytemnestra, she would never do it. Then she shall lift the dripping axe and kill her husband. Are you out of your head? Are you asking for more trouble? Uh, kill me! But a bath of blood waits for you in Argos! Carry him away! <laughs> Have I touched you now? Drag him off! <laughs> Gag me! I have spoken! <laughs> Take him away to where his tongue cannot be heard! <laughs> Well, Hecuba, are you content? I gave you what you wanted. Was it worth the trouble? Go and bury your children. You women must go to your new master's tents. Necessity is hard. It never lets you off. Daphibius! King Polymester, inform him that he will be released and return to his kingdom after he has given me the gold of Priam. Look, the wind has changed. The 
blows into our sails. Now, we can all go home. Cassandra, King Polymester's prophecies, were they true? Come, tell me, prophesy. Hell not. Why not? Why not? No one believes me. No one. Then it is true what they say. You are cursed by Apollo. Cursed? But I am your friend. I have been good to you. Come, tell me what it is like to know the god Apollo. I dreamt that the sun came alive in my brain. I felt light pour into my skull. And I knew. I saw a landscape of time spread out before me. My kingdom. And I saw all things that are to come. Then he said, now pay me. Give yourself now. Let me own you and I will give you time to rule forever. I was frightened. I said I would, but I could not. My mind was riddled, scorched with too much seeing and brightness. I longed for shadows, caverns, dim sea beds. All I wanted was to hide from him, from seeing. I hid, shut my eyes. I wanted so much to be alone in the dark. His heat is white, and despair is white, and the thoughts which race in my skull, please, Apollo, I cannot give you myself, I'm frightened. <coughs> he said, so be it, and he grew quiet and gentle. He begged one kiss of me, I gave my lips to him, and he spat into my mouth and said, keep my gifts. Keep my brightness in you. See it all. The truth about war and all things. But since you lied to me, when you tell that truth, it will seem to those you tell it, toys, baubles, babbles, and they will laugh at you. 